Um, Dr. McTeer earned his BA and PhD in economics from the University of Georgia, and he has taught economics at the University of Georgia, the University of Richmond, and the Virginia Commonwealth University. He's a past president of the Association of Private Enterprise Education, a national association of free enterprise scholars and others who advocate market solutions to public policy problems. He's also something of a poet, and I found this example on his blog. Uh, my house is underwater for sure. My car is upside down, you bet. But I'm getting me a consolidation loan and finally getting out of debt. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> it's an honor to be invited here today by the Federalist Society and an honor to uh, share the table and the telephone with such a distinguished uh, panel. But I'm afraid I was invited because I'm considered soft on bailouts. And that's a terrible reputation to have. Uh, what is it they say in poker? If you look around the table and you can't find the sucker, it's you. <laughs> <laughs> the case for bailouts is usually systemic risk. You do it not for the bailout E, but to limit the collateral damage. The case against bailouts is that by saving management and owners from the consequences of their excessive risk taking or poor decisions, you create moral hazard and encourage similar behavior by others. In most of the so-called bailouts during the panic of 2008, bunched together mainly in September, the decision makers were not saved or rescued. Top management, directors, and stockholders lost their jobs and much of their wealth and were maligned in Congress and in the press. They didn't benefit from a heads I win, tails you lose proposition. They had won for a while, but then they lost. Future decision makers under similar circumstances will remember both sides of that coin and not want to go there. Public humiliation is not something you want to emulate. In fact, Mr. Paulson seemed eager to fire people at the top who had done no wrong so that he would not be accused of creating moral hazard. The CEOs of Fannie and Freddie were following policies mandated by Congress, and they were not the same CEOs that were in place during the earlier accounting scandals. And I believe that the fired CEO of AIG had been on the job only a few months before he was made a sacrificial lamb. And Ken Lewis of Bank of America has certainly learned that no good deeds go unpunished. Now, moral hazard did get us into the mess. The making and the securitizing of subprime mortgage loans and selling those mortgage bonds all over the world was the mother of all moral hazards. Since most independent unregulated mortgage brokers made the credit decisions and unsuspected owners of the bonds bore the risk, misled by their AAA ratings. Many who were saying, let them fail, let them fail, later said that Lehman Brothers' failure was the biggest mistake made during the crisis, and I tend to agree. There were a lot of tall dominoes standing too close together. Now, I'm not sure the system could have survived many other failures like Lehman's which cost me, my little portfolio, about 40%. Given time, I'm sure that the Treasury's TARP program could have been better designed and executed. But under the circumstances, I think it worked pretty well for over 600 banks caught holding mortgage-backed securities and other assets that were no longer trading, and they were having to mark down and lose regulatory capital because of mark-to-market accounting. Now, I won't try to defend TARP's use outside the financial system or the way Congress has used it to fan and pander to our worst populist instincts, to demonize bankers and as a pretext to expand government power and violate contracts and private property rights. The public, egged on by politicians, regards TARP as the government spending their money to support evildoers. Most have no idea that the Treasury will be able to sell its preferred stock and warrants from banks, likely at a profit. 
There will be some losses here and there, but overall, I won't be surprised if the taxpayers come out ahead. And the Treasury reports that it's earned about 18 percent on the banks that have paid back TARP funds early. The Federal Reserve's extraordinary lending last year and securities purchases this year are even more likely to earn a net profit for taxpayers. The Fed generally turns over about 90 percent of its earnings to the Treasury's general fund. Those earnings are expanding significantly with the expansion of the Fed's balance sheet. Skeptics make much of the Fed's expansion of bank reserves and money and take it for granted that that will be highly inflationary. Possibly, but I doubt it. New money must be spent before it can cause inflation. Banks are holding most of their new reserves idle as excess reserves because they're scared to death. And the public has similarly reduced the velocity or turnover of their money. With velocity collapsing, rapid monetary expansion has not been inflationary. So far, rapid money growth has been needed to forestall deflation. Despite some pickup lately, both the consumer price index and the producer price index are below their year ago levels. Prices so far are down, not up. The trick for the Fed will be to adjust money growth as velocity returns toward normal, its exit strategy. Chairman Bernanke's study of the Depression has convinced him that tightening monetary policy prematurely would be a greater danger than tightening too late. Most pundits on financial TV assume the opposite. During the Depression, the Federal Reserve increased reserve requirements on banks to mop up excess reserves. The banks reacted by contracting credit further. It turned out that their excess reserves were not considered excess by the banks themselves. They wanted and needed an extra cushion against uncertainty. Today, the pundits are urging the Fed to make the same mistake to mop up excess reserves before they're used to create inflation. But the banks are holding those excess reserves voluntarily for the same reasons they did during the Depression. Just because they're excess in a regulatory sense doesn't make them excess in a more real sense in the minds of the bankers. While I give passing marks to the Treasury's capital injections into banks and to the Fed's direct and indirect lending, I put the massive stimulus program on the other end of the spectrum. It reminds me of hunting wild hogs with a shotgun rather than a rifle. There's a lot of firepower there, but it's diffused, not focused. It has probably prevented some layoffs at the state and local levels, but at a huge cost in money, deficits, and debt. The Fed made loans, the Treasury made investments, the stimulus program, however, was old-fashioned spending. Money spent, money gone. The deficit as a percent of GDP has already tripled, and outstanding debt is headed from about 40 percent of GDP toward twice that level in a few years. Instead of targeted marginal tax rate cuts to stimulate the private sector, we face the prospects of repeating a huge mistake made during the Depression raising taxes on a weak economy. Not only the expiration of the Bush tax rate cuts, but also additional taxes to finance new government programs like health care, cap and trade, and so forth. In the 1937-38 period, the government raised taxes to finance new government programs already put in place. We face the prospect of new taxes for old programs and new programs yet to come. Another feature of the Depression that we seem to be copying is class warfare against business leaders, but to my knowledge, even they didn't think to have a Pazar. Another danger uh, shown during the Depression that we're, uh, we're moving in the direction of is protectionism. We haven't yet gone as far as the Smoot-Hawley tariff, but we are on a slippery slope in that direction by abrogating the the Mexican truck provisions of NAFTA with tariffs on Chinese tires and with Buy American policies spread all over the stimulus bill. I think that's a good stopping point. Okay. Thank you.